My name is Rick Hill, and I um, really have the privilege of uh, being up here with a group of, of both distinguished and extremely experienced um, people who are, are, going to, are going to talk about the, uh, the issue of development. I, in the morning, um, most of the panelists and, and most of the discussion was around uh, domestic issues, although of course not completely. And this panel has been asked to, to look at, at this issue in the, the context of, of the developing world. It's a, as I said when I stood to ask a question, it's been a very visceral morning to me. I mean, it's a very, it's a difficult subject for um, anybody to listen to and, and to talk about. That's part of the problem, I think, is that we don't, we don't uh, put it on the table. But for uh, somebody who had, had two young daughters in the, in the early 90s and working in a place like Bosnia, talking to men um, who, whose daughters were in rape camps, <coughs> my first sort of um, interaction with the use of violence against women in this context. And it is, as we know now, it continues to be an, uh, um, an enormous issue and it exists so egregiously in, in so many places. It's, um, it's, you know, it's very difficult to talk about. But um, this panel is going to, to look at that issue in the context of uh, societies which often don't have the, the advantage, such as it is, of our own of a, a rule of law, um, often don't have the political will to deal with this, societies which are um, you know, uh, clearly patriarchal and, and don't seem to be moving away from that, and, um, and where the problem is, is much riskier often for women who want to move that forward, choices are less, and thus it takes a lot more creativity um, to try and, and, and make space for women, women leaders and uh, women to be able to, to claim the, their rights as humans. We have um, of the, uh, our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Roma Badajaraji, and I've, I've <coughs> I apologize in, in advance to, to our um, panelists for butchering their names and they've agreed to forgive me. But, um, uh, Romy is, is a, a particularly distinguished uh, panelist, She's, and, and we're lucky to have her because she has worked both uh, as an academician on this issue, as a practitioner from uh, 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 the legal point of view, and also as somebody who's been out in the weeds, as she says, underneath those, uh, those uh, blue tarps in refugee camps and other places, actually trying to, and, and understanding um, the problems that women face on the ground in, in some of these very dire situations where um, uh, in societies where they weren't particularly empowered to begin with and even less empowered because they're refugees or, or displaced. So we're very lucky to have her. Um, I'm not going to, to read her um, a biography that you can do that for yourself. I'm assuming we have a fairly literate crowd here. And uh, with that, I'm going to let her inform us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Namaskar, as they say in Calcutta, India, where I'm from. Savadikai in Thai, in Thai for my colleagues from Thailand, and Chow from my colleagues in Vietnam. And so we're here in a very interesting meeting. The morning was, as, as Rick said, very visceral and powerful. I just want to, before I start, thank the University of Montana and the very distinguished people in this room. Uh, I recognize representatives of government, civil society, academia, uh, and fellow speakers. Thank you very much for inviting me this afternoon. Very quickly, uh, I want to start by presenting two reflections from the morning. I think what really moved me was to recognize the fact that there was in this room a mother who had experienced her child being raped and murdered 
and she spoke from her life experience. We also had in the room people who have diverse experience of working with these issues in the field. We also have people in this room who are doing the thinking behind these issues in academia. We also have in this room people who work on global policy, including people like myself, and people from the Department of Justice. There's such a diversity of experiences in the room, but what makes it powerful, in my opinion, is that you need every bit of this jigsaw puzzle to form a chain and to transform society. No one of these people can do it alone. And that's what brings us to the whole notion of development. So if I may take your time for a minute to introduce my organization. I'm from the United Nations Development Program, which is the development organization of the UN worldwide. And we are present in, we actually have offices in more than 177 countries. And we, one of our focus areas is working on crisis prevention and recovery. The reason being that we believe the greatest threat to human progress right now is a combination of armed conflict, disasters, and climate change. And so this is a cornerstone of our work. And we, you know, this is just a picture of the world and, and some of the areas where we have uh, a staff and offices. And uh, I want to also share with you the fact that, um, you know, I'll leave a copy of this presentation, but we're really talking about huge impact of armed conflict on the world, including disasters and uh, climate change. And with, with that in at the back of your mind, I just want to say that what came out for me from this afternoon was the need for a whole societal understanding of change. You can't change this just using the law. You can't just do this with the conscience of a mother whose child has been murdered. That is very powerful, but she alone cannot change it. Academics cannot change it alone. You need a whole societal perspective to change things. And that's where development comes in. And the fundamental premise on which we work is the understanding that unless human beings, both men and women, have equality at the social, political, and economic level, you can't have change. You can change a law, you can change a little thing here and a little thing there, but you need a societal understanding of change, and that's what development stands from, and that's the perspective from which we work. I also wanted to uh, start with a little story. Um, just leave a picture for you all to look at. It's probably the first. Yeah, uh, what I want to do this afternoon very quickly is to look at the problems from a positive perspective. And really the topic that I'm gonna talk about is turning obstacles and challenges into global solutions. And that's a picture of a woman in Burundi voting, and I'll tell you that story in a minute, but I just wanted to have that visual up there. So the story I want to begin with is a brief visit to Northern Uganda, where I'm had the privilege of talking to a group of women displaced by armed conflict. They were in temporary shelter with a probably bit of blue plastic sheeting on top of them provided by the UN and they were they expressed their concerns to me in the following way. They were worried that they had been separated from their children because the children were in a town nearby getting free education that the UN was providing. They were extremely worried that there was a peace process going on, but there were armed men in the bush, in the, the gorillas, so they didn't feel secure. They were worried about their future. They were worried about the fact that they were going to be moved back into agricultural production where land is owned by men and a lot of labor done on the land is done on the basis of family-based labor. Here were women whose families had been scattered, fragmented, and broken up because of the war. And they didn't know how they then would fit into the future that the people were determining for them. And finally, not one of them had escaped from sexual and gender-based violence. But the whole point is who was listening to them? They, were, they had a very clear understanding of their issues. They were able to articulate it, 
but were we listening? That's where I want to start with. So the second thing is to take you to a very different scenario in 1999, 2000 in Windhoek in Namibia, which is a global policy meeting. Some of us met from the UN and we wrote the background documents to the first ever Security Council resolution on women, peace and security. What did that really mean? That meant that at that time, the stereotype of war was really men in tanks. There wasn't recognition of the impact of conflict on women women and children. And so this is the first time that these issues were brought into the remit of peace and security. And that's why you have the 1325 resolution on women, peace and security. 10 years later, the international community reviewed itself. I'm sorry to tell you, but we discovered that we had not delivered adequately for women and girls. And from that moment, a uh, high-level women, peace, and security agenda has evolved, which is uh, at UN headquarters, supported by the Secretary General's office himself. My own bureau, Bureau of Crisis Prevention and Recovery in UNDP, we are deeply engaged in shaping the global policy of that. And we're trying to do that on two basic premises. One, that it is very, very important to support the voices of women and their participation in designing solutions. Stop treating women as beneficiaries. Stop treating women as objects of assistance. Because until and unless you build solutions that are based on the real experience of the problem, that solution is not going to be long-lasting, and that solution will not be grounded in reality. The second thing that we have also been advocating at the policy level is you need governance. Now, in the question and answer, I can go into the details of what I'm saying. You need governance to be responsive to the needs and interests of both men and women. You need economic solutions that are responsive to the needs of both men and women. You need to have rule of law, access to justice being strengthened so that both men and women have improved access to justice. And finally, of course, the importance of the recognition that you have to provide for the security of women. Uh, you've had discussions this morning about ref refugee camps and, and the, the experiences that women have when they don't have lights and uh, they have to go to the market to buy things for their families and they get raped on the way and on the way back. So unless there is security for women, you can't lay the foundations of peace. So what we're saying is this is not just a matter of women's rights. It's a matter of having solutions that are based in the reality of the experience of the people going through the problem. And those solutions have, can, uh, can be the only ones that lay the foundations for long-term development and long-term peace. Bringing women's voices to the table, we argue, is not just about being kind to women. It's about making the process of consultation broader, more inclusive, bringing in more voices to the decision-making table. And finally, it means broadening the agenda for peace. I'd like to also, I mean, I can't in this time that I've been given give you a snapshot of what we're doing worldwide, but I will give you a flavor of it. In Burundi, and that's the picture you see in the red, the women electing, we have now got the highest number of women in the upper house, in the Senate, in the whole of Africa, and second highest in the world. So people who tell you, sorry, we're in the middle of post-conflict, we have to save lives, we have to put out the fires, please don't talk to us about women's voice and decision-making, confront them with reality, it's possible to change. And this is what's happened in Burundi. We're also working very much with women's economic empowerment. I won't go into details, but including in Haiti, UNDP's assistance, we've ma managed to make sure that in the immediate aftermath of crises, at least 40% of women benefit from the economic opportunities that we're trying to develop. Uh, we're also working with the whole issue of providing legal aid to sex uh, 
survivors of sexual and gender-based violence and armed conflict, often in sub-national areas of these countries, not necessarily in the cap capital city, because that's where the most need for the women are. And we've worked from provision of aid to the whole idea of influencing legislation, working with justice actors, working with the community, working with media, working with religious elders, working with the community. Because UNDP's approach is always embedded in working with national actors. So whichever country you go to, you go in and the invitation of that country and you enable national actors. And it's a long-term perspective because you develop the capacity of national institutions and uh, enable the voices of men and women. And finally, I wanted to also share with you some of the very sensitive work we're doing in below the radar uh, nonviolent conflict resolution, working in mediation processes where we bring women's groups and voices to the process, particularly in Timor-Leste, uh, working with national and international development partners. We have supported the government in establishing a cadre of community of mediators to be absorbed in the newly created Department of Peace Building and Cohesion, of whom 50% are women. These mediators were deployed to assist with local land conflicts and in communities where uh, we're resettling IDPs. Now, this is in a culture where women don't go out of the home. There's a culture of stigma. There's a culture of silence. And they're now trained community mediators. Then there's the whole uh, amazing experience in Fiji where uh, the first independent platform for dialogue between state officials, members of the military council and civil society organizations, uh, the first event since the military-backed advent of the Kanan interim government was supported by UNDP, but there was women's groups who were at the forefront of this platform, which was established through the leadership of women's group and who served as intermediaries between government officials and civil society to overcome mutual mistrust. So what I'm trying to say in, in, in brief is uh, I'd like to say that in spite of human suffering that crises bring, crises offer an opportunity to build back differently, where old inequalities are not perpetuated. Second, given that the often lack of inclusion and inequalities at the roots of conflict, supporting women's voice and leadership, bringing her experiences and perspectives into the heart of solutions, make to, for a more broad-based and more likely to last peace process. It's about making governance responsive and inclusive of the needs and interests of women and men. It's about deepening democracy, bringing in the everyday issues of women and men to the decision-making table. It's about innovative solutions that derive from the real experience of the problems. In the words of the Secretary General's high-level panel on global sustainability, and here I quote, any serious shift towards sustainable development requires gender equality. Half of humankind's collective intelligence and capacity is a resource we must nurture and develop for the sake of multiple generations to come. The next increment of global growth could well come from the full economic empowerment of women. As I've tried to indicate, transforming the situation of women, enabling their leadership, transforms societies, and may end up transforming our collective futures. Thank you. Thank you, Roma. Our next speaker, um, Ms. Mo Haing, is, uh, uh, is, worked, is, is from Vietnam. There she works at the Center for Community Empowerment, a, a Vietnamese NGO, and also serves as a consultant on a, a variety of development projects for the Vietnamese government, for international NGOs, and uh, for Vietnamese NGOs. Um, Please join me in, in wel welcoming Mo Hung. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. Yeah. Yes, I'm Hung Ngo from Vietnam. Thanks, Dina and the Memphis Center to, uh, for giving me this um, great honor to speak in this conference. Um, to let you know that this morning, I feel um, I very much appreciate the discussion and presentation, which um, let me know where we are, um, how Vietnam um, far, is far from the situation 
And I also see that we, we also face the same problems, social problem like in uh, your countries. So that's why I feel more confident to share with you the um, situation of Vietnamese women. Um, uh, and in my presentation, I would like to share with you um, more deeply about the status of women in development uh, based on my seven years um, experience in development in Vietnam. Um, I've been working for Save, um, Save Children US since 1995. And in 2002, I uh, joined my current organization named Center for Community Empowerment. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, one minute about Vietnam. We are the country located in Southeast Asia, and we are one of the ASEAN members. The total land area is uh, as same size as Montana, <laughs> which is about um, uh, 130 square miles, but we have uh, 10 times population. <laughs> so we are crowded, um, uh, crowded people countries, especially in the cities. The population growth rate created for us many problems in, in uh, social and uh, just challenge for development work in Vietnam, which I will share more detail later. And uh, about Vietnamese women, we account for uh, about 50% of total population. And um, just to let you know, about 70% about of women aged from 18 to 55 or 60 years old still working. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, share with you about the Vietnamese Women's Union. That's very important organization in development in Vietnam. Most of the development projects and program in Vietnam have been working with the union. I myself have been working with the women's union in about 40 provinces to deliver the programs on, uh, for women and children. And now I will um, lead you to the roles and challenges of women in social and culture, political, economic, education, and health care. First of all, about political particip participation. And uh, I would like to um, use the cases of two of my program partners, Ms. Ting and Ms. Le, who are uh, my counterparts before when we worked together in the program for um, a program named Opportunity, economic opportunity for women, and another program that child rights protection. And uh, about 10 years ago, both of them uh, were sent to the National Assembly and the People's uh, Provincial People's Council. And it's very good for um, Vietnamese women and children to have the, those women to participate in the National Assembly and to the uh, People's Council, because women uh, and children's issue was brought up and was considered um, carefully. For example, Mrs. Ting tried her best to advocate for the uh, microfinance uh, program in Vietnam, and now we have the degree, uh, the law for microfinance in Vietnam. And also, Ms. Le, uh, she uh, tried her best to um, set up the uh, association, association for child protection in every province. That's, um, uh, uh, and we, beside that, being um, women relative in those organizations, women faced many challenges. Uh, for example, um, it's hard for them to, to be uh, in the, how can I say, uh, key leaders position, but mainly serve as a vice boss and works as a subordinate for the men. One of the reasons uh, is that um, the capacity of women uh, representative in those organizations have not yet met the requirement. Uh, they were selected partly because of uh, the quota. The government and uh, the Vietnamese government set, set the targets or quota for having 30% of women in politics, participation, uh, participate in politics. So, 
Uh, some of them were selected when their capacity have not yet been met the requirement. And I had chance to work with them in one uh, training uh, to improve their capacity in nego ne negotiation and public presentation. And I found that some of them, especially the young uh, representative, still not have feel self-confident in themselves. Another uh, challenge is that um, the retirement age of women is uh, five years earlier than men. That uh, Women have to retire at um, uh, 55 years old. So from the year 50 years old, their political opportunity somehow was blocked. And um, talking about roles of women in economics, I would like to share with you my women beneficiary, those women who have been working with me since 19, uh, 2001, more than 10 years ago, when we lent them the small loan to uh, improve their you know, economic situation. And at that time, we lent them only um, $15, $20, up to $50. But many of them didn't dare to take that loan. They didn't know how to use the loan and use for what. And we have very uh, famous, funny story in Vietnam that the poor women and poor household took the loan from the bank and keep in the box. A year later, and, uh, they brought and to uh, repay the loan. And when we asked for the interest, and they said that, oh, I didn't use that, so uh, how can I have interest? And that, that's, that's a very famous, funny story. But um, have been working with them for 10 years and more than 10 years, and I witnessed the changes in their capacity in using uh, the, in using loan in generating activity. For example, they not only invest in uh, rinse, uh, uh, rinse, uh, rice field anymore, but in husbandry and uh, services and small business. Um, yeah, this is uh, what women use the loan for try to diversify the sources of income. That's why it uh, significantly contributes to the reduction of poverty uh, level of Vietnam, which is now roughly 15% and mainly in the remote and mountainous area. Uh, that's, but the pressure of having higher income to cover the, the, the increasing living costs, that creates many challenges for women. Uh, that's on the screen, you see that's the women move to the city to um, conduct the hard work or work as unskilled labor with low income. The reason was the agricultural land was reduced and uh, in many uh, provinces for urbanization, for industrialization. That's why both husband and wife have moved to, moved to the cities to work to earn their income. And another reason is that um, the gender discrimination still happens in many companies. Uh, some companies, they, they just want to recruit the men. For example, in uh, the assembly, the assembling companies are uh, technical, and they don't consider that women can do that work. That, that's uh, another challenge for women in economic. And talking about education, I'm happy to share with you uh, that recently in Vietnam there are many women like us, like um, myself, Dr. Ha Do, and my friend there. That's, uh, we have great opportunity to improve our education level. And uh, in general, except the, the, the mountainous area, in other reasons, in Vietnam, parents try their best to send children to school, both uh, boys and girls, um, because they consider that's uh, the best way for their bright future. And the um, Vietnamese government also have a policy to promote education in uh, the poor family, such as uh, loan, uh, priority loans for the students from poor household. But uh, in the women and children in the mountainous and remote area face many difficulties in education. I just take the case of Ms. Hoa. She's one teacher in um, uh, Yen Bai province. 
when we visited her class, she was not there, and none of the, the students was there. And finally, we found her uh, in the village, where she go to every household to call on the kids. And uh, she said that whenever she go back to her house, her home that's in the town, um, she bought many candies and toys. To, and then when she go back to the village, and so she used that to attract the children to class. And in her class, there's only one girl. Because, and, uh, because their house uh, far from the school, far from the class. And when she taught in King language, popular Vietnamese language, uh, her students answered in their minor ethnic minority, minority dialect. That's, uh, that's the, the language barrier. And also perception of parents uh, in some areas, they seen, think that uh, girls should not have high education. Um, talking about social and culture, uh, recently uh, Vietnamese women participated more actively in social activities and the men, like my husband, has, uh, start to change their behavior, chef, housework. Um, he didn't, um, no, no. He, he was not afraid of being teased by his colleagues and friends that, oh, uh, this, that guy, he does uh, women's work, or he should wear dress or skirt. <laughs> and, and he even, uh, ten, more than 10 years ago, he supported me to have a master's degree before uh, he got that, despite the fact that his mother, I mean my mother-in-law, didn't want to. <laughs> and that's, um, that's some obstacle of, um, of the women in social and culture, especially that's for the poor women in the rural area. And I had chance to work with the farmers uh, who go to the city to work as a worker. And they try to spend any penny of their, of their low income to, uh, to send to their parents to support their family. Uh, despite the fact that they are minority women. And uh, also uh, because of migration, because of the pressure of uh, um, uh, trying to have high income, so they, um, why they uh, lack of knowledge and un understanding about safe sex or relative health. So that's why the, uh, the many, how can I say, uh, social problems happen, like uh, HIV AIDS or that's abortion. That means, uh, for me, that's uh, the life of poor women who are migrate to the cities to work are very um, miserable. Mm -hmm. And I would like to uh, try best to help them. That's uh, my presentation f uh, time is run out. And hopefully, I will have a chance to share with you more when you ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohang. Our final presenter on this panel doesn't need any introduction for almost all of you here. Um, we're extremely lucky to have, to have Terry um, for many reasons, but uh, in particular for this panel as a consequence of, of his uh, long study of this issue in the context of China. And so with that, let me ask you in, in helping me to welcome Dr. Terry Wiener. God, I feel so tall. Um, am, am I blasting you if I'm like this? Okay. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, we've, we've obviously indicated that the issue of women's empowerment is not specific to any culture, that it's a global issue. But we all know, too, that um, the, manif the way women's issues are manifested are deeply affected by culture. And so one of the things I want to do is to talk about that question within the context of Chinese culture. Um, we all associate the subordination of women with Confucianism, um, but the fact of the matter is that it predates Confucianism. Um, that we know from the history of the Chinese language, which began as pictographs and, and vastly predated the Confucian influence on, as a philosophy and governmental system, that women had a subordinate role. Um, 
the, one of the primary characters representing women is a kneeling figure. Um, a, the word for women, fu, is a woman holding a broom. Um, women in child under a roof is the character for good. Um, uh, or, yes, women, a uh, woman under a roof is the, the word for peace. Um, woman in child is good and so on it goes. Um, you also have strong influences from um, Taoism, which was coterminous with Confucianism that reflects the subordination of women. Uh, you know, yin is weak, dark, female. The yang is light, strong, male, and so it goes. But the fact of the matter is that Confucianism um, played a dominant role in sort of re-emphasizing um, the subordination of women. Uh, so Confucianism was at its basis an attempt to respond to chaos and disorder, and it did it by trying to create bonds of hierarchy so that people knew their place and stayed in their place, and therefore the impact would ripple out through larger society. And part of those bonds were women being subordinate to men and wives being subordinate to their husbands. Now, no philosophy is going to have a huge social impact. It has to be embedded in the rice roots. And it was very significant in Chinese history and society that um, the philosophy of Confucianism was reinforced by popular religion. Um, and specifically what we in the West loosely call ancestor worship. Um, in pre-modern China, and even today, there's a very strong belief that Unlike in Western cultures, there's a very significant direct link between the living and the dead, right? And more specifically, if the living do not sacrifice for the dead, they will wander in agony, in our equivalent of hell. And so it puts an enormous um, burden on the living to make sure that that line of sacrificing, of taking care, not just of your parents, but their parents, and their parents, and their parents, all through history, is not broken, okay? Um, so that means having children. And in the Chinese context, it more specifically meant having boys. And that was because of the, the social custom throughout most of China of patrilocal marriage. Women left their villages to enter the family of their husband. And so that meant that they were lost. In fact, there's um, one of the ancient characters for women is literally goods on which one loses, <laughs> right? And so this had obvious repercussions that <clears throat> if there was a time of enormous um, shortage, as there often was in China, you had to make a choice. There was only enough medicine to keep one child going, and one was male and one was female, the male got it. If one child was to be educated, it was the male, and so on. I mean, you see this rippling um, through society. Um, and it was exacerbated um, by the sort of growing rigidity of Confucianism from above. One of the questions I ask today is, why do you think that if things are worsening, why are they worsening? And my take on it is at a time of enormous change, um, males get scared <laughs> and they circle the wagons. And we saw this actually in the 10th century in China. This was a time when the Silk Road was developing, uh, non-Chinese peoples were coming in, new ideas like Buddhism that challenged Confucian philosophy. You got urbanization, um, prostitution, you know, women who weren't as tightly under control. And the result was the old Chinese guys getting together and deciding we need Neo-Confucianism. And what it was, it, it reinforced all of the bonds and it, it did so in a way that it spawned one of the worst abuses of pre-modern times, which is foot binding, right? Foot binding started out as a f sexual fetish and it developed into a sign that one was of significant um, stature that you didn't have to work. So foot binding, most of you know, I think it's not just binding the foot, it's breaking the arch. <laughs> so it's physically crippling women. And it's interesting as one of the few times in history that the wealthy exploited the wealthy. <laughs> 
but unfortunately it was one gender only. Right? Um, so things have changed very significantly in China during the reform. Um, as um, China's East Coast in particular has developed a very large middle class, things have changed very fundamentally. I mean, most people who are um, city dwellers in China and the East Coast are like us. Two working adults, very busy. They only want one kid. Um, they just as soon have a girl because we know that boys remain immature for 30 or 40 years. Um, so the people I'm talking about in the rest of this talk when I mention economic development are rural people. Okay. And they were fundamentally, um, their lives were changed fundamentally first by the Maoists who came to power in 1949, who as part of their attack on what they call feudal society, all the abuses of traditional society, attacked um, foot binding, um, made arranged marriages illegal, um, made, uh, promulgated a marriage law where women had equality in marriages and could unilaterally divorce their men, created a land law where women had equal right, legal rights to own land, and so on and so on and, and so on. Um, they also, during an otherwise completely disastrous period called the Great Leap, liberated women by creating communes where women went out side by side with men to work in the fields and work in factory. So this put an enormous burden on them because they were still doing all the rest of the stuff, just like we do now. Um, but it, it did significantly enhance them. And women became co-models with men as tools of development. So this holding up half the sky thing, again, is a Maoist saying that reflects that fact. Um, unfortunately, as the Maoists gave, they also took away. And one of the most disastrous policies that goes back to the 1950s is an encouragement of people to have more children. And this was done for many reasons. Uh, this was a time when China expected there to be a nuclear holocaust. More people, more people will survive. You know, China will always remain. But they also they figured very reductionist um, thinking, more workers, more development. So what we see is China's population um, skyrocketing from about 540 million in 1950 to over 900 million in 1978 when the reform period began. So this is gigantic. So this has a, a fundamental impact on everything China does today because this demographic lump in the snake has to be dealt with, right? Everything they do is impacted by this huge burden of population. Um, unfortunately, one of the most direct consequences of this astronomical climb in population was the one-child policy, which began informally in 1949 and formally in 1979. So it's coterminous with reform. And we all know the horrors of the one-child policy. Forced abortions, often late term, sterilization, um, and what it did along with development, so one of the ironies was that modernization, the move toward a market, reinforced um, sort of traditional abuses because with the one-child policy, it again meant that boys were better than girls. And again, especially in rural villages, now we can make money. The more kids we have working in the fields, the more money we can make. Boys are better, right? Um, and so you see the consequences of this, and they are also magnified by modern technology. Ultrasound, right? So now people know the gender of their kid before they're born. And, um, you know, it is illegal to use ultrasound except to assess the health of the child in utero. But in practice, you slip a doctor a couple hundred yen and say, well, doctor, what do you think? And the doctor will say, I think he has your smile, pointing to the husband. Right. OK, thanks. Well, go ahead. Um, so this has in itself led to yet another logical consequence, and that is very skewed sex ratios in China. 
the Chinese formal statistics put gender differential at 107 boys to 100 girls. Independent studies put it more like 119 to 100. And in some places, it's 140 to 100. And that means that um, a lot of Chinese men now cannot find wives, which creates dire straits, not just socially, but because of the traditional ethic, we need heirs, we need boys, we need to continue the family line. And this has led, in the worst circumstance, to yet more abuses, um, female trafficking. North Korean women, young Filipinas, oh, come and get a job in rural China. Oh, you're Lao Zhang's wife now, congratulations, right? Um, so um, that's, that's sort of um, ironic that modernization and the trends created by specific policies have, have led to such dire consequences that weren't foreseen. Okay. Um, modernization has had a cross-cutting effect in other ways. Um, with the boom of China on the East Coast has come a huge gap in wealth between the East Coast cities and China's rural interior. Four to one gap, most people think. And so this has had a huge impact on rural villagers in that they, they are desperate and the cities are Mecca, right? So there are currently 125 million migrant people rural migrants who work at any given time in China's cities. And many Chinese think that if trends do not change, there will be 230 million within 20 years. That conditions are so dramatically different in rural countryside versus the city. So this has cross-cutting impact. Um, one positive impact is that many rural women have gone to the city, and although they work in sweatshop jobs, there are still jobs. and we all know that um, women's status is based most fundamentally on their financial independence and their contributions to the family, right? And by the fact that they are now working outside the home and have these jobs and send money back, their status has risen. Um, but again, um, no good deed goes unpunished in the fact that a lot of these women, although it's better than the village, work in disgusting jobs. And many of them cannot get jobs. And so 50 years after, the, after prostitution was virtually eliminated in China, there is now a booming sex trade in China. And 80% of the women involved in that sex trade are rural villagers, women who are so desperate that they're forced to do that. And it's, some statistics um, put the total number of migrants working in the sex trade at 10% overall. So, um, but again, I don't want to end on a total downer. <laughs> and the fact is that um, through modernization, many, many women have gotten opportunities, jobs, education um, that have allowed them to um, raise their status, to compete with men, um, even in cases where males leave the villages to work in the cities, they leave women behind they take full control of the household, and when the men come back, sorry, it's not the way it used to be, Buster. <laughs> and so there's a lot of anecdotal evidence about men really getting upset, but that shows that women are standing up. And so I think that although there's a lot of bad news still related to population growth and so forth, that um, there has been a fundamental change in just two generations that I think many women um, would never have thought possible. Thank you very much. Hoping to tease out some of these issues. In Thanks, Terry. There are a number of pretty interesting issues that our panelists raised, and um, I hope our Q&A can get to some of those. But the ones that strike me um, are the issue of economics and the role of economics in in power and empowerment and uh, political will and political power. I'm just, I'm struck by the fact that uh, I've recently read articles that some of the, the richest women in Asia, or some of the richest people in Asia are women, that the, the both the president and the, the head of the oil, the government-owned oil company in Brazil are women, a, 
developing country not that long ago. And it makes me wonder what the impact that's, that's going to have on, on this whole issue in, in those places. With that, uh, let's open it up for questions. Anybody? I'm going to facilitate here. Any questions, anybody? Oh, I thought you were going to ask a question. You weren't that boring. Come on. Um, thank you. That was very well said on all fronts. And it, I, I'm not exactly sure how to put this, and I hope it doesn't sound too esoteric, but I think that the notion of development is, uh, as, as you said, Roma, in the early on, is, is change. And what you are all discussing is what do we change, but also I think what we don't always look at uh, very well or very concertedly is what do we want to preserve? And then who is involved in those decisions about what we keep and what we don't? And so in a very, very broad, broad sense, I'd be interested in your perspectives on that from each one of you because you're coming at it from slightly different angles. Um, there's some of these things that we may or may not have all that much uh, control over. Uh, previous population growth and so forth right now. But there's other things that we might. And I'm just throwing out there, law and education certainly might be one of those ways or those inroads to helping women have more voice on what they want to keep and what they want to change. So very general, but um, just as, as a way to open it up, perhaps. Would I like to start? Roma? Does this work? Yeah, yes. all right. Thank you for that very interesting question. Uh, I just you know, have a very simple reflection, really. Um, I'm philosophically against telling other people what they want to change and what they want to preserve. But I'm very invested in exactly, as you said, enabling women to have that choice. Because one of the reasons why we work on gender equality from a development paradigm is we address historic inequalities that women face at the political sphere and the economic sphere and in the social sphere. So that's the problem that we are seeking to serve. And exactly in the manner that you stated, investing in women's girls' education, investing in women's health, I mean, these are fundamental issues that provide them towards economic empowerment. And from my humble experience of working in crisis countries, uh, I used to try and get women into decision making, into various kinds of uh, uh, political platforms. You know, I was gung-ho about women in leadership. And they told me, Roma, if we don't have money to buy a cup of coffee, if we are worried about our children, how do you expect us to be leaders? And so something that I've understood experientially is the fundamental importance of economic empowerment of women. That is fundamental. It gives you a leverage to negotiate, whether you're negotiating safe sex, whether you're negotiating violence, whether you're negotiating for political voice. That is a pretty fundamental area, and you can't do that without education. I mean, education, I think, is central to to enabling people to choose what they want to preserve and what they want to change. Thank you. Well, then, you want to make a comment? Yeah. Thank you for your very nice question. That's what we have been discussed many times in our programs. And uh, I would like to take two examples for um, uh, in, in two subjects. For example, in economics, um, I, I've shared with you before that in many um, areas, women and their family didn't want to borrow the loan because they, they didn't know how to use that and they were afraid of being in debt. So we, we didn't urge them or try to encourage them to, to, to borrow the loan. Uh, but we provide them the opportunity for uh, just, um, understanding or having more information to make choice or to, to see the opportunities of um, 
uh, being uh, or knowing how to use the loan in um, raising their uh, household income. So that's one example. And um, we find we call the positive deviants. We didn't teach them sh you should invest in this or do that like other programs, but we just um, uh, provide them opportunity to attend the training about um, women uh, in economic empowerment, something like that, and that they, uh, and that's, that's one example. Another example is that happened recently in women participation in politics. As I said that, the government set up the, set the targets of uh, having at least 30% of women in the, uh, uh, the political organization. But in many provinces, we, we don't achieve that target. But we, we, we let women themselves choose to, be, um, to, be a party, a party, to participate, participate or not. Uh, and we, uh, we also understand that um, not ap after discuss with them that they have many challenges being uh, involved in leader, uh, leadership, uh, like you said, or in politics, where they have many things to do at the uh, mm, household, where, where their husband haven't supported, and also where their communities. So in that situation, we just discuss with them and provide them information. We don't try to, uh, to, to get them to change, uh, to achieve the number or the target. Um, one of the things that's clear, I think, in all societies is that law is um, necessary but not sufficient. Um, one clear example in China, I mentioned that China now have full legal rights to own land, which is, um, well, or at least long-term leases to land, which is as close as China gets to private land. Um, but it's clear that um, there are a large number of cases where women, when they leave their villages, they're supposed to get an equivalent amount of land and they don't get it. So it's very difficult to enforce that kind of thing. Um, in China, one key is to stop <laughs> this policy where you um, control women's reproductive rights. And again, this is, this is a very difficult issue. Were it not for the one-child policy, there would be 400 million additional Chinese, much more hunger, much more poverty, and Western um, conservatives would be bitching and moaning, but they would not be supporting those kids, right? Um, but in fact, the, the one-child policy is being eaten away because for reasons good and bad. Um, one is that um, China has figured out that draconian enforcement is not good. They're moving toward a policy of encouraging people to have girls by giving the, the more family support for people who have girls. There's also the reality that uh, China has um, far, few, far too few young people to support a massive aging population. So you've got one kid supporting four grandparents. And that alone makes it very difficult to continue this system. So a couple years ago, China came this close to formally ending one-child policy. And I think that they didn't want to send that signal. And so they've just gone, gone toward um, much more lax enforcement. And so, again, this is a two-edged sword that China really doesn't need an exploding rural population. But I think the trends are such that if China can continue to improve the livelihoods of the rural people, that nature will assert itself and that will have um, a more natural process of people becoming less superstitious, more secular, um, just wanting a kid, not a boy, and so on. So that's a long, obtuse non-answer. <laughs> Another question. I don't see anybody with their hand. Oh, here's one back here. Thank you. Um, as we're looking at global trade, and in this country it's just so critical that we open markets and we increase trade and we get pork products to China and we get tar sands oil to Asia, et cetera. Um, I'd like the panelists' reaction is how positive to the people in those countries, I'd say particularly the women, is this strong, strong emphasis from our country on 
more globalization, more open markets, et cetera, et cetera. And if that's not totally positive, are there other things that we're doing, the United States, that's positive in the economic role, particularly in these countries? Well, I think globalization has been absolutely vital for women in China. Um, and it was a fundamental choice of the party in 1978, following the disaster that was the Cultural Revolution, to improve the lives of the people. I mean, basically, the Communist Party had squandered any legitimacy through insane Maoist policies. And Deng Xiaoping created a new um, basis for legitimacy, and that is, are you better off now than you were four years ago, basically? Um, so again, this is good news and bad news. The fact that the, one of the phenomena I talked about was the emergence of a middle class, um, which has opened up vast new opportunities for urban women, but also the fact that China is, is now fully committed to globalization and industrialization and exports have fed all these factories in places like Shenzhen where rural women can go and get jobs, lousy jobs, but jobs that give them income that they could never have before. Um, I think that's vital and I think it's not something the United States has done except that it buys tons of Chinese products, but it's something that China has, has chosen to do itself. Um, the downside for globalization is that in for a penny, in for a pound, right? So that um, that China is affected by global trends from which it was buffered before. So if there's a, uh, a rice shortage, it ripples throughout Asia, right? And it certainly affects China. Um, another part of it is that um, this growing income gap, that China has flourished, certain parts of China have flourished under globalization, but the interior has been left out and it's, it's not by choice or policy, it's just that communication is bad, education is bad, there is no water, <laughs> there are no resources, you can't attract investment out there artificially. Even incentives haven't worked. So um, objectively speaking, probably rural people's lives are better, but the perception is that we're being left behind, and so there's much greater unhappiness, including among women, than there was when everyone was poor but equal. And I think that is directly tied to globalization. Yeah. Uh, I would like to share some experience uh, in Vietnam about the effects of uh, globalization, uh, both good side and bad side for me. The good side is that there are ma many jobs were created and uh, many women can work in as um, workers in the factories to raise their income. The, their household income was increased so they can have money to build the new house, buy motorbike and other facilities. But the best side is that, uh, like I said before, uh, try to, to save the money, try to, to have the higher income. So they accept the very poor condition, living and working condition. That, that's why it's very uh, badly affect their health. Another um, problem is that their understanding about legal. Oh, that's, they, they just uh, don't understand about or don't have enough understanding or knowledge about law, uh, uh, their rights, something like that. So they didn't know how to raise their voice to, with the employer, even when they, uh, they was um, treated badly. And when we worked with them in one project funded by Oxfam Belgium through the labor union, and we found out that they lack of many um, life skills in, in um, working in those um, factories and companies. So that's, that's the bad side. And um, my point is that it will be good if we provide our, um, uh, enough capacity or understanding for women and also how to keep the balance.
these economic products are based on cheap female labor and quite often below w the standards of work, pay, uh, human conditions in which they work. And, and that's what makes the product cheap and makes the product uh, um, very uh, um, easy to sell in the global market. So uh, yes, li liberalization and globalization has brought new opportunities, but I think the benefits of globalization are very skewed and uh, there's a huge literature about it. So um, that's about all that I can comment on. Question back here. Um, thank you to the panel, and I wonder if um, you might address, if you choose to, issues of income disparity in the United States among men and women. And I think the last statistic I read is that women still make 30% less for the same job compared to a man. And I wonder if the developmental perspective or the development perspective that you've discussed today might have some relevance here in the U.S. And if you might muse on that a bit. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, during my two weeks fellowship with the YWCA, I had chance to know about this problem and I already compared with the situation of men and women in payroll system in Vietnam. Actually, the ratio is that uh, when men earn uh, $1, the women earn only 0 0.69 cents. That's uh, somehow similar with uh, uh, one part of Lower, that's, that's uh, in the same work. Do have a comment back there on this? Um, I want to say something. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm Professor Dotuhai. Work here um, for one semester. Uh, I'm from uh, Vietnam National University, and I think that uh, uh, Ms. Ngo Hang talk about NOG, but she doesn't know much about governmental system. For example, yes, for example, like uh, uh, our um, job, everything is equal in government system. That's right, you know, I, that's right, I asked her why she got something like that. And another thing that, uh, for example, uh, I, I myself believe that in our country, we have one saying that uh, God can save anyone who can, shall, you know, can save themselves. So it means that uh, we have to, for example, like for women in my country, in particular, and everywhere in, world in, in general, I think that uh, we have, I agree that education is the best investment for the future. For example, like in my university, Vietnam National University, we have 50,000 students. Yes, and my university, 82% female students. And our lecturers, 64% female lecturers and professors. So I think that before when I joined the system of education in my country, about 20 years ago, at the time, only 10% for women, for the lecturers. But right now, the, the thing is changing a lot. And I can say to you that in our country, you know, uh, the employer have uh, two choices. One, they will choose women because they're very hardworking, indisciplined, know, you know, what they are doing. And they're very, very patient. And, you know, we work very hard. But another option is that they have to pay a lot for social security. For example, you, uh, you because you are women, so you get pregnant, you uh, give a birth to your children, and then um, uh, a lot of things at home you have to do. So sometimes, you know, they are afraid because if like that, they have to pay for security, for health care or something like that. That's right, you know, I think that they have two choices. Like me, in my faculty we have, uh, I, 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 I work for faculty of oriental study. 50 Vietnamese lecturers and 25 foreign lecturers. And 50 
35 women. And, you know, continually they have uh, children, Brennan or something. Like that. You, you know, we have to accept, but they are very good, you know, employees. So we still, you know, want to employ them. So I think that the system is uh, a little different from, you know, uh, the private section. Yes. For example, like uh, it, for the government, right now is in the cabinet, 14, 14 ministers, among them, six are women. Yes. And the 93% Vietnamese government, uh, women go to work. We are very independent about finance purchase in the family, and we, you know, I, I think that a lot of foreigners, when they come, they're very surprised. They think that we are very strong, even compared with men, because we know that we have to, you know, stand up for our life and for our children. But I'm sure that, I talk that um, have a two sides of globalization, is that, you know, the young people right now sometimes they have everything, but they don't know where it come from. And one thing that uh, my university have many surveys in society every year. Very bad news for you is that, for example, one, last year we uh, have a survey on, the, we had survey on the four biggest city in Vietnam. The rate of adultery among men is 43%. We cry. Another thing is that two-thirds of, you know, prostitutes in Hanoi come from rich family, not poor family. They want to have a good life, but they don't want to do anything. They don't want to work. So it means that education, the knowledge, you know, I think is much more important because the economic, you know, situation can change very quickly, but society change very slowly. And another thing I think that this morning, you know, one uh, speaker talked about abortion right in the U.S. I tell you something not very happy is that in my country, we are free to do that. If you have a birth control, Vietnamese government pay for you. You are free to do that without any fee. But the problem is that the rate of abortion in my country right now highest in the world. So people will think that, OK, I can do everything with my shell. But how about the morality? How about, you know, the hell of the government? You destroy your shell. So I think that our way like that, have a balance, is much better. Yeah, we try to fight for something, but we have to, when we have it, we have to know, you know, what to use it for. I think like that. Thank you very much. I have time for one one more comment or question. Thank you. I'm Sutada from Thailand. I would like to share something, uh, my thought about development. Um, after listening from the panelists, um, I think um, there are a few uh, perceptions about the uh, development that different between uh, people who are in developing country and people who are from the so-called developed country. Um, and also, I'm glad to hear from the uh, UN um, officer or director. Or, uh, um, I think we have lots of discussion in, in among CSO or civil society organization in Thailand. You may say NGO or non-government. We are sort of... Um, analyzed in the past 20, 30 years that we get, uh, we have been given aid or what you call de uh, development program from international, either uh, from international 
um, agency like UN Women or UNDP or either by country wise. And we found that those uh, support or money is come together with the um, program, what we call is the instant program, like instant noodles. We just uh, open the box and put the, uh, water in there and eat. We feel that that's not good for our country for, for long term because it makes our country firstly spoiled, secondly we follow the program without knowing where we're going to. And second, thirdly, they are uh, left with, you know, sometimes the program is just cut off. Maybe in the in the budget is uh, finished the budget, but um, the project is still going. You know, so um, so now we turn off, um, stop receiving program or uh, support. And some of our uh, organization, I mean, in local, they uh, stop uh, giving, uh, receiving the money as well. But uh, and another another problem from the international or other country developing program is they like to work with government bodies, and you know, so we are end up with double boards, two boards, you know, one international level, second one is national level, and it's top-down program. This is kind of thing that I just want to share and maybe you guys can uh, discuss when you want to help people in developing country. Please um, maybe listen to them what exactly they, they want and uh, what kind of support. They might not need money. They might need something sharing or you know, strategy or whatever. So this is um, I want to share with. Thank you. Okay, I think we've run out of time. Thank you uh, for your attention. I hope we've been able to launch you out of your after lunch lull if you had one. And join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>